Good afternoon. Greetings, salutations, welcome. Well, what a wonderful turnout this afternoon. Thank you all so much for coming. As I said, greetings, welcome. We're thrilled to have you. My name is Sharon Farb. I am the Associate University Librarian for what we call distinctive collections here at the UCLA Library. And on behalf of the University Librarian, Virginia Steele, and everyone in the UCLA Library, just really want to welcome and thank you for coming to our amazing program this afternoon, Opening the Doors to Contemporary European Literature. It's also part of International Education Week. We're really excited to be a part of that. It's really important. As I kick this off uh, this afternoon, I want to begin with a land acknowledgement. UCLA acknowledges the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of the Los Angeles Basin. As a land grant institution, we pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relations of the past, present, and emerging. I just want to spend another moment or two to welcome, in particular, some of our distinguished guests and visitors. So we have a number of members, I'm thrilled about this, from the Los Angeles Consulate Corps. We have friends from the UCLA Library. There's students, there's faculty, there's colleagues. And our guests of honor are sitting in a place of honor at the front. So we have our amazing writer, Bianca Belova, and we have the Czech Council, Yaroslav Olsha. And I want to thank you both so much for making time for us this afternoon. You'll see to my left, many of your right, we have a little table over on the side. It has books from our student uh, bookshop, the ASUCLA. Thank you, ASUCLA, for showing up. Uh, if folks would like to purchase a book, that is where to do it. And at the conclusion of the book talk and a little Q&A and some questions from the audience, we'll invite you to come back up to the front and uh, Bianca will sign your book for you. Yay, we're super excited. Um, there are many things about this program that align it with the mission of the library. And I'm just going to touch very briefly on a couple of those. Um, for our friends who maybe this is their first time coming to visit us in the UCLA library. So among the several ways are about creating and fostering partnerships. I was able, I was fortunate to be able to be a part of a tour with some of the Counselor Corps a little earlier. We talked a lot about uh, partnerships and collaborations around the world. It's also really important to us and it's very mission critical that we advance a global and diverse perspective and if you look around you'll see there's a lot of diversity in the room and we're gonna and we embrace that here at UCLA. We're a public institution and we're super uh, excited to be a part of the diverse communities in Los Angeles and beyond. Um, and third, it is, as I mentioned, International Education Week, and that's a larger program that the campus does through the International Center. And actually, today, there are a number of programs going on on campus, not just this one, in celebration of International Education Week. Um, and so I wanted to just throw out, for those of you that might remember this URL, a place where you can learn about other activities throughout the week that you might find of interest, because they're also international programs, and that is global.ucla.edu slash IEW for International Education Week. So if you all are interested, please check that out. There are just a ton, literally, of programs that you might find or colleagues of yours may find of interest. Okay. Now, before I turn it to Elena, I just have some important thanks and gratitude to express. So uh, first, this would not have been possible if it wasn't for several people who have 
helped us throughout the process from planning to catering to the bookstore um, to the room etc so uh, Susie Lee who's standing in the back that some of you might have met is our events planner and big thanks to Susie and Giselle Rios who worked on this with Elena from the outset we also want to thank um, Mr. Yaroslav Olsha, as I mentioned, and Anita Campbell, both from the Council General of the Czech Republic. They have been just seriously best friends and colleagues to us. Not only for this, they also visited the Film and Television Archive, which is part of the UCLA Library. They've got some things cooked up uh, for the new year, and we are thrilled to be able to work with them. Um, and for sure, not least, but last in my thanks and gratitude, is Elena Ising. So Elena, I know many of you in this room know um, because she was part of uh, the inception of this program. Elena is our librarian for Slavic and Eastern European studies. And Elena, I invite you to come up now. Elena will uh, give some further remarks, introduce our speakers, and then we will be off and running. So thank you again, everyone, for coming. I'm super excited for this program. Thank you, Sharon. I must say, without the support of Sharon Farb, it would not happen at this, end, this wonderful event. So thank you again. Um, also, I would like to thank Giselle Rios for designing this wonderful poster and also for the social media together with Susie Lee, who organized all the events here. And without them, this wouldn't happen either. So. Thank you also for Ruby, Ruby Balcom, who is my supervisor, and she will give um, uh, remarks at the end of this event for her support, and for all my colleagues who were supporting me in this program. So my name is Alana Ising. I work here since 2019 as the librarian for Slavic, East European, Central Asia, and some of the Caucasus countries. I work closely with Alice Hunt, she is my colleague and helps me with all kinds of um, programs and issues that challenges that come and she is very supportive in my work. Thank you. And um, I just want to say welcome. I had the pleasure to meet some of the very special guests. Um, I, I met Simone Bliss from Austria a diplomat who is now in LA, um, from Lit Latvia, um, Lithuania, uh, Laima Jurebiciene, uh, from Finland, Marta Lieto, from Croatia, René Pea, uh, from Ireland, uh, Siobra Quillen, from Germany, I didn't meet him today, but he was working with us before, Stefan Schneider, and from Estonia, Jak Treyman. And we had a wonderful time for an hour. We visited collections uh, upstairs and also the special collections. We had a tour and got to know each other. Um, I would like to say a little bit of a history for our cooperation in 2019. Um, there was another Czech consul, Mr. Schepelag, and together with him and the German consulate, we organized a in-person exhibit, and it was in a memory of the, the end of the 30th anniversary of the Cold War, and it was called The Fall of the Berlin Wall and the Rise of the Velvet Revolution, which was in display at the Pau Library from November 7 to March second and the exhibition was very successful we had about 200 people and we had a wonderful program and then when mr Jaroslav Bosha came in 2020 we organized uh, an international symposium called uh, robot is 100 we were exploring the influence 
of the sci-fi play of um, Karel Czapek called R.U.R. and many art forms uh, that came out of this creation. Um, so we had some history here to, working together and we are planning on other projects in the future and let's go back to the current one. Um, I realized that I need to learn a lot about the contemporary literature in all these countries that I cover and together with Mr. Olsha we came up with this uh, program and uh, fortunately th there was our guest Bianca Belova who is now traveling throughout the United States and she's stopping here in Los Angeles so it was a great opportunity to start this series. So I would like to welcome um, Bianca Belova, she was a, a, a born in the Czech Republic, uh, she grew up in Prague, she written a number of books, for example, Sentimental Novel, 2009, Dead Man, 2011, Nothing Happens All Day, 2013, and The Lake in 2016, Mona, 2019, and these fragments, 2021. So this um, book is not the only one she wrote, and she got, um, she won the top Czech literary award, Magnesia Litera, and the European Union Prize for Literature in 2017, which was now translated in several languages, including English. And something about Mr. Olsha, he's a Czech diplomat whose posts include in Zimbabwe, South Korea, Philippines, and now he's in Los Angeles. And he also is author of several books on history, art and literature of Asia and Africa. He is also science fiction editor, translator and bibliographer. And he is very interested in research. He enjoys the library very much. We, we had a tour, private tour with him before, and I was amazed about his knowledge about almost everything we talked about. And I said, you should be a librarian. <laughs> so, anyway, I hope you enjoyed this program. Uh, I welcome you, everybody, students, friends of the library, public um, from the campus and professors, thank you for coming and I will give um, the word to Bianca and Jaroslav Osho. Thank you very much, Alana. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, thank you everybody for coming and I'd really like to thank the USLA Library for having me. I'm totally humbled to be able to present my work at, uh, on the premises of such a, an honorable institution. I would also like to thank the General Consulate of the Czech Republic and the Czech uh, Lit, which is a Czech literary program for promoting uh, literature abroad. Uh, okay, I will also, also thank you, Alena, and I will also want to thank you, Sharon Fab, for organizing this. We hope that uh, this first event opening the doors for contemporary European literature could be a kind of a tradition in UCLA and we hope also the consulates and honorary consulates will take part of this opportunity. As we are now holding the presidency of the European Union, it was one of the projects we came to an idea that we can bring the consulates and university closer and see how we can support the, especially the smaller European languages and smaller European teaching and smaller European collections here. I don't want to say that German and Austrian collections are not important or French or Irish, but you know, English is so widely known, that means there is a plenty of English and German and French books around. But there is not so many Lithuanian, Croatian, Czech and Slovak. There is no Slovak also, but we have to work for the Slovaks as well. And uh, we really hope to help the university and we also help to bring more writers here and do something more. But uh, first of all, I would say that we start with this and we have also a small donation to the library. We looked what is missing in the collection of the library and there is a small box of, let's say, 40 books by Czech writers in English. We started with the first gift, 
which gives an idea into uh, books which are missing in the library and which covers everything from Czech fairy tales to Czech science fiction. Logically, as you heard, Czech science fiction could be missing. And also the classics and also other writers, including Bianca Belova, Hair the Lake. I think it's important that we follow the suits, all of us, and we support this con new concept, I say, literary diplomacy. Because we have a film diplomacy, music diplomacy, but there is not so much as a literary diplomacy. That means let's try to start it during the Czech presidency. First of all, there was an introduction of Bianca Belova, maybe a few words to, uh, to it. Uh, her book was published in more than 20 languages, uh, among them Japanese, Korean is forthcoming. That means it's a really a first novel after quite a long time, which is really becoming global. And this is great that we have now English edition of the book. And uh, I really hope that this book, which won the most prestigious Czech literary award in 2016, Magnesia Litera, and afterwards the very important uh, award the European Book of the Year, European Literature of the Year, is really coming now to the United States and we hope it will find some new readers here. What is the book about? It's really very much timely book because uh, with the Russian attack on Ukraine, the topic which was some kind of a forgotten, that means post-Soviet world, post-Soviet republics is now coming once more on the on the title pages of the newspapers. And this book is really about something like that. It speaks about a Nami, an orphan who does not have a surname, but whose given name could mean famous. He is living in Boros, a little village located somewhere in the former Soviet Empire, on the bank of the eponymous lake. This is the lake from the title of the book. But he must take to the city that lies across the lake and back in order to know and understand himself and the people around him. But he soon finds out that the people are just as cruel in the city as they are in his own village. And he lives in a really, really kind of a dystopic world. The world full of doom and disaster. The water is sour and toxic. There is no rain in spring and no snow in winter. The villages are afflicted with various illnesses, cheeks riddled with burst veins, cracked feet, and everyone, everybody has an eczema. And also there is a plenty of fantastic elements, such as mysterious spirit of the lake, sacrifices to whom are constantly made in order to please it. It's really a very visual world, very much dark world, very dystopic <coughs> world. But we from we who lived in former Eastern Europe know that it's not as fantastic as might look like. It is in a way reality. And uh, maybe a small comment and we can start a discussion, questions and answers and discussing the book. Comment. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I find it difficult to talk about my own text because I always think that if you want to know something about it, you have to read it. Um, but it was a it sums it up very well. I think we will have a, a, an opportunity, or you will have an opportunity to hear an excerpt uh, later on, and um, may give you an idea. Uh, it's um, a story that I like a lot, but uh, it's uh, I wrote it about six years ago, so it's uh, already in the past. Uh, but it pleases me to come back to it and meet the heroes uh, or the characters in you. Let's ask the first question, because we both grew up in the last days of communism and remember really those times which were complicated and it's for you, it's something very weird and you don't understand it. Uh, there is a lot of symbols of that communism, for example, a symbol of representation of the statesman, which is everywhere in the book. Once a powerful dictator in the standard Soviet fashion, personifying the Soviet empire. Does it really mean that this is about the Soviet Empire, or it's more magic realism, or it's more science fiction and dystopia? I wouldn't say it's a science fiction and dystopia. <laughs> I think uh, the story is actually inspired by uh, the story of uh, Lake Aral, which is uh, 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 located on uh, the border of three, or used to be three. Uh, former Soviet republics, now only two, because uh, a lake is drying out, and this is one of the themes in the, uh, in the book. And uh, if you actually look at the uh, state of Lake Aral now, which, was, which has almost disappeared due to uh, 
human intervention, it's much, much worse than in my book. Oh, yeah, that's true. That means let's hear a short part and short extract. Bianca will read us. It's a part where Nami, uh, we basically uh, uh, follow Nami uh, through him growing up from the age of about three until the uh, adulthood. And this is a story where Nami meets his first love. The ships now sit so far away from the original port that the children have made a soccer field between the high tide line and the original port. The surface is on a bit of a slant, so whenever you pass the ball, it tends to roll towards the water. It's impossible to run without stirring up dust, and every once in a while, someone's foot plunges through the stiff crust of sediment. Abandoned concrete piers covered with rotten algae jut from the hardened sand and mud. Trash litters, the ground beneath, the mo mooring rings. The only pier that runs all the way to the fishing boats themselves is wooden. Every six months, the fishermen extend it a few meters further, so they won't have to walk across the parched lake bed with their fuel canisters and baskets of fish, and to give them somewhere to tie up their boats. A few small barges are scattered across the exposed lake bottom, their cracked holes visibly decaying in the sun. Nami lies on the dry grass overlooking a concrete pier, at the top of a hill where years earlier the Russians erected an antenna for interplanetary communications. At that time, it was still taken for granted that they would fly to other planets, establish settlements, and hopefully join forces with the ex extraterrestrials. They even learned about it in Nami's school, but eventually the teachers stopped talking about it. The concrete pedestal was graffitied with symbols clearly meant to represent genitals and the huge parabolic antenna bent a little closer toward the ground every year like a wilting sunflower. The paint was peeling off the ribs on the back of the dish in long, dark red strips. Nami lies twirling a blade of toxic grass in his mouth. The sun hangs low over the horizon, casting lengthy shadows. The dust filling the air covers clothing, chokes nostrils and lungs. A grungy stray dog, creeps up through the grass and lies down near Nami. He has a large bump over his right eye. Nami flings a stone, chasing him away, and the dog trots off to lie down again at a safe distance. Nami, glancing down into his hands, decides they look untidy and begins cleaning the dirt from underneath his nails. Peering off toward the city, he sees the girl on the road. The golden aureole of dust rising up around her makes her look a little like a specter or a ghost. Nami goes on cleaning his nails, pretending not to see her. His mind is made up to let her pass without a word. His bowels are constricted and his stomach aches the same way it does after swimming in the lake. The girl catches sight of him and shyly raises her hand in greeting. He nods. The girl Age Lily pushes off the concrete wall and swings herself up. Walks through the dry grass toward Nami, flip-flops slipping in the dust. She sits down next to him. You'll get your dress dirty. She waves her hand dismissively. Seems kind of silly wearing a white dress around here, Nami says, feeling like he's choking. He starts to cough. What with all the dust and what with the dust and all, he explains. The girl clicks her tongue at the dog, who starts slinking towards them through the grass. Don't do that, he's nothing but fleas and ulcers. I feel sorry for him, look at how alone he is. The girl is sitting to the west of Nami so he can see the fine hairs covering her neck and arms turning gold in the sunlight. He rolls onto his belly. The girl clears her throat. Uh, <coughs> I'm Zaza. Nami. Oh, I know. You do? Of course, everyone knows who you are. What do you mean, everyone? Are you kidding, says Zaza, looking a bit startled. Oh, never mind, it's just that that time I saw you at the bus stop. Ah, oh, whatever, it doesn't matter. He spits out the blade of grass and plucks a new one. He hopes she doesn't notice that his fingers are trembling. You've got nice eczema, he adds in an offhand way. 
What do you mean? Says her friends. Just like most people's, it's all red and puffy, but yours is like sort of rosy. It's cute. Oh, I hope you don't take it the wrong way. I rub it with lard, but it doesn't seem to help much. I heard there was a baby born with three hands. Yeah, there's two-headed lambs born all the time, but three-handed babies? We haven't had that before. It's out of sight. As soon as I finish school, I want to get out of here. He nods. Maybe we could go together. Zaza smiles and nods. So I'll come back tomorrow, okay? Okay. Nami watches her walk away through the dusk. It's all he can do not to reveal the gazes of joys erupting inside him. Beyond the dry docks in the distance, he sees a home surrounded by piles of junk and a man in a diving suit moving around the garden with a dancer's grace. Thank you very much. Uh, this sequence very, very much uh, has one question for me when I read the book before. Uh, Nami and all his friends and all the people around the lake are living in a really extremely bad situation. We would probably not want to like uh, live there. And uh, there is that sense of acceptance. That means they accept accept the situation as it is. They want to leave, but still they live there and maybe one day they will leave, but they don't really feel it's something enormously different than it should be. For me, who also lived in the communist regime, this was the typical thing, the sense of acceptance that there is a fate and we live in something and we have to overlive it or live it a long longer until eternity, until one day. And uh, the, is this once more the connection with the communists? When maybe we can comment on the situation, maybe this is also the answer why the people in Russia still support Putin because they have the feeling that it's normal. Mm -hmm. that means, is it this? It's a psychological phenomenon. It's called something like learned uh, resignation or something like that, where you basically learn that whatever you do, you don't uh, uh, help yourself. It doesn't improve your situation. You stop, so you stop trying to... to kind of resign because you uh, that's a waste of energy so it's something some kind of attitude that you uh, and it's the only thing that you know the environment that you with the kind of relationships the uh, interactions uh, whether you learn it within family or your closest community um, and it's uh, getting breaking out of that is more of a uh, it takes courage and it's more of an anomaly yeah but you know, you you have been to Soviet Union, you have been to Russia, I suppose. Do you see no, it still? No. You have never been there? No, that means there was no prepared question. You have never been. <laughs> it's interesting because I have been and I must say that yes, I saw it when I was in Ukraine mm. in nineteen eighty nine, or even more interesting in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan in the nineteen nineties. Mm. That kind of the fate and people really don't change much. You saw the hotels which are still empty and nothing and I had that feeling when I was in in, uh, in uh, Kyrgyzstan, the same one as I saw in your Nami book. But uh, coming back to Vladimir Putin, many people say, many people say that uh, there was a prophetic book in a way that you, you had an idea what will happen because you saw that grim future, but it's a grim past or it's a grim future? Uh, well, it's, uh, I wouldn't say it's a prophecy, uh, I'm not clairvoyant, uh, but it's uh, basically working with uh, knowledge and working with history and our historical experience. So living in Central Europe has always been a bit dodgy. Uh, there was always this uh, threat looming from uh, various sides and uh, we have had that experience with uh, Soviet uh, army and occupation and uh, it was uh, quite obvious uh, when uh, Russia first uh, invaded or uh, uh, occupied Crimea in 2014 that it uh, wasn't going to stop there and it's uh, unfortunately the reality we're now facing because we didn't do the right thing at the time. Oh yes, that's true. But there is another thing that means um, uh, in a book there are very many symbols of the decline and the end and collapse of communism in the former Eastern Bloc. It is shown, for example, by one thing which is not as mysterious. Everything is really mystery and you don't know the names. 
The only thing which is there are the Russian soldiers who are departing. That's the only thing which is really realistic in a way, because Czechoslovakia had a significant contingent of, of Russian forces and many countries in Eastern Bloc had them, and they were really leaving in the 1990s. And also, when the Russian soldiers left, uh, the statesman's statutes were disappearing in your book. But uh, even at the end of something, of something evil, the people hoped probably in some significant change for better, that automatically the situation will change for the better. And your book says that there is no hope, I think there is no change for better. The Russians left and nothing is changing. You know, mm. that's, there, where is the hope? I wouldn't say there's no hope. I actually uh, left the, uh, the, the ending is open and it's up to uh, the reader to, to uh, make it end the way that he or she pleases. And uh, I do actually see a lot of light and a lot of hope then. Okay, that means uh, I think that next extract will be absolutely in the contrary what you said, because I say the departure of Russian soldiers says the change, and in the same moment you say there is a hope, but when the Russians, came, when the Russians left, the situation is getting even worse. And uh, I will ask Bianca to read a small extract in Czech, and you have the English translation on one page, so that you can take the page here. Just to give you an idea what Czech sounds like. <coughs> Pardák Nikitič ho naučí, že když do povrchu asfaltu rychle načepne klacíkem kosočtverec, nezůstane po něm téměř žádná stopa. Skoro celý se vpije do podkladu, najde ho jen ten, kdo o něm ví. Když zůstane s čerstvě položeným asfaltem sám, kreslí do něj námi nenápadně svou bolest. Velké bábiny ruce, křivku ženského těla, slepice v páchnoucím kurníku, tři trojuhelníky. Když své psaní rychle pomočí, zůstanou jeho tajemství v povrchu silnice přítomna, i když jen ve formě nečitelných a rozpětých run. Mistr ho jednou přistihne a dá mu facku, ale nechce po něm, aby povrch opravil. Hrbolatý asfalt tak jeho tajemství ponese, dokud nerozpraská letními horky a zimními mrazy a nerozjezdí ho nákladňáky se sírou. Celý sírový areál už je vyasfaltovaný křížem krážem, příjezdová cesta taky. Zbývá jediná silnice, ta, která vede od skladu k jezeru a končí pod vodní hladinou. Když na ní námi uhlazuje hrablem asfalt, je už horký de letní den. Námi má na sobě silné pracovní boty a kalhoty z režného plátna, pokryté kapkami dechtu, triko má ovázané kolem hlavy. Po nahém hrudníku mu teče pot. Nikytiž sedí ve stínu a leje si na hlavu vodu z plastové láhve, kterou pak zahodí za sebe. Nikitič je dobrá, zhruba 35-letý chlápek spočínající pleší, kterou si zakrývá kšiltovkou. Rád o sobě prohlašuje, že vychodil univerzitu života, čte noviny a rád filozofuje. Vzhledem ke svému utržkovitému vzdělání pak často dochází k chybným závěrům, ale není nikdo, kdo by s ním polemizoval. Nám je vzhlédne, obloha ho oslepuje. Na poušti na západě vidí tmavý mrak, který se zvětšuje a přibližuje. Co je to Nikitič, je ukáže rukojetí hrabla. Nikitič se posadí a posune si kšiltovku do týla. No jo, co to kurva je? No mi se opírá o hrablo, je malátný a ospalý. Mrak se pomalu přibližuje a zvětšuje. Nikitič se tebe na břiše. Člověče, nejsou to kobelky. No mi začne v mrašnu, které se na ně snáší rozeznávat jednotlivé body. No ty krávo, to jsem v životě neviděl, už to někdy viděl. Vydechne Nikitič jako děcko. Námi zavrtí hlavou, tohle ještě nikdy neviděl. I když mu bába vyprávěla, jak jednou do Borosu přeletěly kobelky a spásly úplně všechno, co jim vyrostlo na záhomenku. Zásoby ve skladiští, dokonce svačiny školákům sežraly a kabele od rády. Námi rozeznává těla hmyzu, křídla a obrysy černých nohou. Kobelky se začnou snášet na zem po tisících a tu se tu všich má na sobě. Hystericky je ze sebe se třásá. Většina jich přistává na ještě rozpáleném asfaltu, kde se přilepí a s nesnesitelně hlučným cvrkotem příliš dlouho umírají. Vy krávy, křičí Nikitič, jděte mi do prdele, když jste mi dokurvili hotovou silnici. Horkem se těla kobylek vysuší a mumifikují a jejich pozůstatky tu z asfaltu budou trčet až do zimy. Silnice připomíná 500 metrový koberec navržený šíleným designérem. Nikdy po ní neprojede jediné auto. Jen námi se po ní občas prochází a těší se z toho, 
jak mu mrtvá hmyzí těla praskají pod porešví a komponují pro zvláštní melodii. The book is very visual and I even see it as a black and white film because I saw all the time when I was reading the book of black and white. I didn't see many colors in the book. Which color is other dominant? White and black and is there any other color in the book? Do you feel that it's colorful? That there's super space where Nami lives? I can see the uh, the desert and the dust, so kind of grayish, browny colors. Grayish. That means once more we are in various various versions of black. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a black and white film, but it would be uh, wonderful. But why do you write? Huh. Uh, I don't have a choice, I guess. Um, from the few things, I'm not saying I'm good at it, but uh, it's probably the thing that I can do the best, and I, I, I have this calling, and I think that. If I do sense that there is a, a theme or a story that has to be written down, it is uh, my uh, greatest satisfaction to try to tame it down and shape it and you know, put it down on paper to, uh, in a way that I find satisfactory. And wouldn't you ever want to see Arauz, to see really the, the, the real story which was a spark of, your, of the interest and spark for creating the novel? I didn't write about RLC, it was just an inspiration, so uh, I don't think it's necessary. And I think that um, a writer should have the fantasy that uh, uh, should lead him uh, or should lead the story to the, the way that uh, is necessary. Or intuition. And it was really surprised when you said that you had never been to the former Soviet bloc because I, I logically assumed as everybody who lived in the former Soviet bloc we have been to Russia and Soviet Union. But I think that uh, your vision is so deep and so dark that I see it in it, and regardless that you have been But you don't see the light then? I really see it black and white, and I'm, I see really the novel extremely uh, dystopic, uh, negative, uh, pessimistic. And I really haven't seen that uh, hope at the end, but this is my soul, not yours. That means you see the reader who, who sees it slightly differently. Uh, but another thing is that means when we ask about why you write, in one interview you have mentioned you completely avoided all interviews, tours, mm -hmm. literary festivals in the beginning of your writing career. But you have recently promoted your book in Japanese in Tokyo. Uh, now you are almost 6,000 miles out of Prague promoting in LA. Is there a mm -hmm. change? Well, they told me it would be sunny in, in LA. <laughs> and now I get like flash warnings on my telephone. <laughs> you see how, how Hollywood is creating the wrong, wrong image of Los Angeles because when I was coming here, I also thought it's a hot place with a beautiful sunshine all the time, and it's not. And now you see it. It could be gloomy as Nami's world. Uh, well, I, I do uh, think, I do believe that the book is the only thing that should speak to the uh, reader and the reader shouldn't have to need any other explanations by the author should, uh, the reader shouldn't need the author for anything and I still believe that but I realized over time that it's actually necessary to promote the book from time to time <laughs> <laughs> it's a necessity okay bare necessity but uh, that means maybe you don't need to really work with the reader, but you have to work with the translators. Mm -hmm. As a translator myself, years, years, years back, I do understand how crucial is the communication mm -hmm. with the person who interprets your words into, into different languages, especially if the language is really distant. That means it's a kind of a very specific interpretation. How do you communicate with the translators? I know, for example, the story of another of my friends, who is a famous uh, Czech translator of English and American prose, who met uh, one of the authors who translated, who, whose name was Margaret Edwood, and she said, well, I'm not interested in any cooperation. That means that there was zero reaction that he wanted to discuss his translation. That means, do you work with your translations? Do you really Absolutely. talk to them? Explain them what you don't want to explain to your readers? Um, I think it's uh, the, the role of the, uh, of the translator actually taking the text and leading it over to another language is so very important, especially in a book 
where uh, the language is important, like for me the language is really important, uh, and I judge every word to try to figure out whether it has a place in that, in that text. So <clears throat> it is very important for me to, uh, to, to get a, a, a true, true translation. Uh, so um, I work with two types of translators. Uh, uh, the first type is those that translated without me actually knowing about it, and then I realized that the book had already been published. And, uh, and there is the second uh, type of translator, which I much prefer, which are the ones who keep bothering me with questions. I get like long lists of questions uh, in which the translators are trying to understand what I meant, how I meant it. Does it is this uh, uh, something, a saying that I made up, or is it a... A, f a generally used phrase, uh, phrase, and uh, through that process, I, I believe that they do get to, to a more true tr translation. And I also, through that years, actually found some of my best friends amongst those translators because they are the people with the same kind of interests and vision of the world, and uh, I value them really dearly. I understand you can't really control what your Japanese translator does mm -hmm. with your book, of course, but uh, as you speak perfect English and you have a translation in English, are you the person who has the last say? Are you the person reading the translation saying, I would say it differently? Do you try to change the translator and translation? Uh, oh. There isn't uh, many languages that I can actually control it, but even if uh, I could, I, I do trust the translators. So there are sometimes little uh, uh, questions that arise through their translation which we discuss, debate, and then sometimes it uh, turns out that the translator didn't understand it um, precisely, So, but it's a question of debate. Uh, I haven't got a last word. But have you discussed really the translation in English, the yeah, translation, yeah, all, all yeah. text? Okay. Yeah, uh, Alex Zucca, who's the translator, a uh, New York-based translator from Czech, is uh, an excellent and professional uh, translator, and we did have a lot of discussions. Okay. And also I know that uh, some of your translations got in the awards for the translating, that means, could you mention something about that? Yes, I think it was um, a nomination. Yeah, nomination. Yeah, it was... Uh, big uh, Polish prize called Angelus, uh, which is uh, where translated books get nominated and the translator together with the uh, uh, author gets an award, so I was uh, shortlisted for that and also in Italy uh, the um, book, the translation got some nomination. I also want to mention that uh, Bianca now returned from Toronto and uh, Ottawa and she's going f further to Chicago and New York where she will participate in promoting the books uh, as a part of the European uh, Literature Week, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. in New York. Night. And I, night. night of European Literature. Okay, that's wonderful. That means, any questions on your side? Shy, shy. <laughs> Don't be shy. Some of you read the book already, I know. Yeah. Seems as if you've been putting out a book every three years or so. Do you have another one in the works already? Uh, well, I actually published that wasn't already there. Mentioned that one was uh, published in spring this year, so I need a bit more time for that. Mm -hmm. It's called Ostrov for the island. And it has nothing to do with the lake. No. When I saw it first, I said, okay, that's great. It will be the same word, but it's not unfortunate. Like puzzle if it's good. <laughs> <laughs> More questions? Yes. Hi. Uh, who are some of your own favorite authors? Who well, are my favorite authors? Some oh, of them, yeah. where do I start? <laughs> um, it's so so such a wide range. I, I, I read anything. It's like for me the the story is the king, and I need to see uh, the story to develop and and uh, climax and to to make sense. And I do believe that stories are here to kind of try to put sense into the chaos of the universe around us and and a meaning. So any story that uh, uh, has that potential uh, is good for me. Currently I'm reading, what am I reading? Um, um, I forgot. Uh, 
Picasso, which could always be my favorite. Uh, Ian McEwan, uh, Toby Morrison. Um, I would also read genre literature like um, thrillers, even or spy spy novels. So uh, I, I wouldn't choose. Uh, basically, the genre is not a, not not a limit to me. Also, we want to mention that she also wrote one of the science fiction stories. <laughs> and uh, some of our science fiction people already said that Island is a science fiction. It's on the list. That means genre. If you didn't know, Mr. Osha is a sci-fi fan. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Michelle? Um, you were talking about um, when, after you read the insert, um, you were asking her about um, people reading and stuff. In your world, um, what things being that bad, um, is there any place in the world that they could go think where things aren't that bad? I mean, because I'm seeing, you know, like you're talking about the lake almost disappearing that, that they're living on. That's kind of all over the world. Like me, used to be a couple of miles long, now it's apparently a puddle in, in Nevada, and it's all over the world. So in your world, in your fictional world, it, could those people migrate out of that area to a, a better place? Are there are there better, are there still better places on the earth? Oh, I don't think it's. Do they know about the better places? In well, that's a question. I mean, uh, uh, but Nami, the, the main character, goes to a uh, town, to the capital city, in, in uh, hope to, to find a better better uh, environment for himself, and then, then he goes out into the desert and uh, tries to figure out something for himself there, but uh, it's not very, uh, none of the environments is well, very welcoming because he's like really uh, alone uh, in this world and it takes a lot of um, suffering to to find the people who could, who could actually help him. But um, I certainly do believe that there is countries who are doing a lot better off than some other countries, like look at Bangladesh. <coughs> I am intrigued by the titles of your work, like Nothing Happens All Day, um, or Sentimental Novel. Uh, can you like say a few words of each of the books? Like, Is it similar to your uh, like, or is it something completely different? I would say that uh, like this one's my Tribute, a sentimental novel, which isn't uh, very much of a novel, and it's not sentimental either. Uh, this and this, uh, and the third one that you mentioned that is not here, nothing happens all day, uh, are kind of uh, books uh, which are quite similar in a way that they are taking place in uh, Czech, Czech Republic. Uh, uh, <coughs> In the last uh, in the recent years, or we'll say, starting from 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and that uh, there is some sort of reflection of those years and the society uh, being done in the, uh, after uh, what we call the revolution in the in, in the Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia in those days, uh, <clears throat> and how the uh, how that uh, passed, which wasn't uh, very easy, and it was it required a lot of moral dilemmas and a lot of compromise, um, ethical compromise, and how the uh, how the um, characters deal with it when um, when they have to pay, face the consequences. Uh, after that, I wrote the lake and. Uh, which we spoke about, and Mona, which is kind of, uh, I would say, uh, uh, they, they belong together because it's a, a similar kind of setup where the uh, uh, book is taking place in a country that we can't quite uh, name. There is no specific uh, time, no specific uh, geographic location. Uh, but the main character is a, a, a woman. And then this one is a collection of short stories, so that's completely uh, different. And 
last one. Ostrov, the island, is um, kind of, um, that was a real adventure for me because it was a uh, kind of escape from uh, the pandemics and from COVID times where uh, we were in lockdown and there was nothing much to do and uh, uh, the situation was very, so very uh, new and different to what we knew and there was a lot of uh, conflict, a lot of social uh, pressure and I used the opportunity of pandemics to, to write this book which is a complete uh, adventure story of this uh, merchant who goes on his travels to uh, <clears throat> Uh, uh, through the uh, known world, uh, so through medieval, or this was on the verge of uh, uh, medieval times and the new, uh, modern times, uh, through Europe to Persia, and uh, he's on a quest of finding, um, or in a dilemma uh, where he's, uh, one of his quests is to uh, uh, fulfill a wish of his father and uh, on the other hand he has a, a, a romance, a romantic affair and he has to decide between the two. Uh, so, uh, uh, but in, in fact it was like uh, I worked with a lot of uh, uh, legends, uh, uh, bible stories, uh, bestiaries, if you know what that is, that was like a bestiary, it was a collection for, for uh, medieval travellers, a uh, collection of all the beasts that there are around the world and their descriptions of what they do and how many legs and how many heads they had. And this is also reflected on the cover. And it was kind of a tribute to all uh, stories that our civilization is based upon, and I enjoyed writing it very much. Yuck. Uh, just as a point of curiosity, when you're working on a book, uh, what kind of a routine do you go through, if any? <laughs> if any is good. Um, uh, I'm very much uh, driven by intuition, if you like, so uh, whenever that takes over, I have to sit down and write. So I can't really uh, control that very much. But fortunately, I write really short books. <laughs> it doesn't take a long time. So, but I would maybe sit down uh, and write one paragraph. Next time I would write uh, three pages, and then I have to wait for months before I know what has to happen next. So if that is a routine, then that's it. I can relate to that. <laughs> because it's not my, uh, it's not my job. It's, I, don't, I don't live off my writing, so I have to make a living doing something else. It's basically a hobby, a kind of luxury that I allow myself. I have a specific question about the Czech reader, the current Czech reader, because when I grew up in the 80s, we would stand up in front of a bookstore, you know, night before something was released. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it, it was, uh, you know, forbidden or uh, limited edition of mm -hmm. the books. and. So we used to read on the underground, right? People read all the time. Is that still the case? Or what, and what is your relation with the Czech reader when you have debates like this or you go to festival? I think the debates are the same everywhere. Um, and I think the uh, Czechs are still quite avid readers. There's a, a lot of uh, readers who uh, to read a lot and they go to the library and they read their three books a week or something and I think the average is quite high even though there is complaints all the time that the young people don't read books mm. and it is a uh, I I was uh, debating at some secondary school the other day and uh, the students were actually asking me uh, why do you think we should read books when we can watch it on Netflix? <laughs> <laughs> But if I can add, uh, before COVID, uh, still the Czech Republic produced something in between 10 to 15,000 titles a year. Of course, many of them were textbooks, of course, but still it was an incredible number. 
and still the print runs are quite high. You should understand that we are a nation of 10 million people only. That means the market is extremely, extremely small in a way. And if we add a 5 million Slovaks who are still reading Czech, it's a bit addition, but not so big. And it's really surprising that we still see the people reading. You can go in a tram and you see people reading. They are sitting in the benches and they are reading. That means it's still there. But I unfortunately must confess that although I'm an avid reader and uh, I am a person with uh, having a huge library, I don't see any single attachment of my son to books mm -hmm. and reading. And he also watches things. And w when I learned myself by reading the books, he is uh, learning his uh, during the TED uh, for various uh, uh, shows on 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 uh, YouTube, and he re re uh, he learns the different way. And is the question: Will it really influence the literature in the future? Maybe, maybe we don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll have to. You will have to write next book as a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever thought about that? Uh, I had a lot of uh, these titles turned into audio books. Immediately, no, no, start uh, the next book only as an audio book. Uh, <laughs> I still have to write it down. Okay, you, but they will read it by hearing it. Any more question? I just have a comment. I was lucky enough to visit the Prague uh, International Book Fair in June, mm -hmm. and I read that there was 54,000 people visiting over two days. Mm -hmm. So I think there is still a lot of interest. And there was a lot of people mm -hmm. everywhere buying books. Mm -hmm. And some of this was very hot and some of them were fainting. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> reading and standing in lines. No, I was there too and it was shocking how really the people wanted to see and touch and buy. And that's also important, read, touch and buy the books as well. That means that's important and I saw it. Maybe it was a post-COVID weekend, we have to wait for the one more next, <laughs> next Prague International Book Fair. Any more questions? I have a question about um, official sponsorship of literature in the Czech Republic. Is there, gover is there much government funding supporting literature? Um, not really. <laughs> How to say it? Um, this, this is being recorded, right? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wouldn't say uh, there's a lot of complaints about it. Um, I, I actually think, and I think that my colleagues are probably not going to like me very much about it, but I think that a writer who's doing too well can't write a great uh, book. If you're having too much of a good time, you can't uh, write a groundbreaking uh, piece, I think. It's my belief. Do you understand? As Bianca does not want to comment on the support of literature, me as a state official will comment, yes. Uh, there are uh, various programs and yes, uh, they are not adequate. And my interest specifically was all the time the support of translations of Czech literature. And I must say that it's not adequate and will need significantly more money uh, to be poured in. I served as ambassador to South Korea and I saw how Koreans are very aggressively promoting translations of Korean literature. Yeah. And it would be very great if we follow many things like that. But hopefully there is one small spark of chance. That means uh, it's, a, it's a kind of an army word, but you say that there is hope at the end. That means I have a hope in this as well because uh, our government uh, has pre almost approved the participation of the Czech Republic as the focus country on the Frankfurt Book Fair, if I'm not mistaken, 2026, 2027, something like that, which is uh, something. It is really important focus that Czech literature will be seen all over the world. Everybody who is coming there will see our literature there, and there will be also quite a significant interest in translating the Czech literature. That means I hope this is a chance of it. And another chance is, of course, to support the Czech language studies on various universities. And I'm happy that we still have Susan Kressin here, who could teach Czech in the UCLA. And hopefully it will once more restart. Thank you. If 
I may say just something about the uh, translation into English. Um, it was a real task. It was a real challenge for my agent to find a publisher willing to uh, translate, uh, uh, to publish an English translation of my book, uh, compared to any other languages. And we were sort of looking into it, and we were analyzing the uh, British market, book market, and only about 5% of uh, books sold in the British market are translations. And of those 5%, uh, majority is uh, uh, great languages, like Spanish, French, German, maybe Russian, Korean. Uh, and so uh, I really, really appreciate the uh, foreign readers who are willing to, uh, who are not scared of picking up a, a translation of a, a, a book from a small language. And I hope there's more of them coming. There is, of course, more tradition for translating into Czech, and uh, this is the big, uh, big uh, difference because many Czech writers don't understand why there is no interest in big countries and big languages of translation because our country is filled in with translations. Most recently, there was a translation from Welsh, direct translation from Welsh into Czech. And there are a couple of really languages we can translate into Czech and for us reading translations is an integral part of our reading habits and uh, we would like once once in the future that also Anglo-American world will understand that but let's hope. I have one more question if I may. Uh, you mentioned that uh, um, do you have another project that you can play with and you can maybe speak about? Or I cannot speak about it. <laughs> 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 I'm too superstitious. <laughs> okay, any more questions? That means thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, enjoy some Czech beers. <laughs> and some almost Czech sweets because they are from Viktor Benesh, which was the originally a Czech company operating here from the World War II at the end. And please don't forget to buy the book. And it's not important. The most important is to buy it and read it. <laughs> That's the important part of it. Thank you. I would like to invite um, Ruby Belkam, who is the chair of the International and Area Studies Department here at the library. And she is also in charge of the Africana studies and the international development. And she will give you uh, closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it is my pleasure to um, make some closing remarks um, following this very stimulating conversation. Um, I think that besides the fact that we are able to gather together once again um, after being, you know, shut away in our little places these past couple of years, um, the fact that um, we have people who are inspired to seize opportunities such as that um, Ms. Bianca Belova is traveling and uh, to create a program around that and uh, also the link that we have between that and the International um, Education Week. Um, it is just a, a constellation of forces uh, that I don't believe in coincidences. I think that this, <laughs> this was meant to be, and uh, this has been very enjoyable. I'm very, very grateful to our guest of honor, uh, who is the author, and also to Mr. Olsa, who has been a driving force, along with Elena, uh, in putting these kinds of, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, educational and culturally rich programs together. Um, I am so surprised to see 
so many of you here. Because when I woke up this morning, I said, oh, no, <laughs> not today. <laughs> not today. And on top of that, today is election day. And, uh, you know, people have had their uh, entire programs uh, today disrupted by the weather. Uh, some, I haven't voted. I'll go vote after this. So <clears throat> that you all braved all this and came together, I am so pleased and so grateful because um, Elena and her team uh, put a lot of work and thought into this. And I'm so glad that it turned out this well. And I'm uh, also thankful to the rest of the uh, diplomatic corps that's here, uh, the faculty members, um, students, staff members, friends, um, all of you. Um, uh, particularly thankful to Sharon Farb, um, the Associate University Librarian, um, for, to whom we report for her support because she sponsored this program and she encourages us to do, to continue working with the community in this way. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of words about international and um, area studies at UCLA. Um, we are a small group of about six librarians and um, about, now we have about three and a half FTE of, um, uh, of staff uh, who we all work together as colleagues. And um, we cover, I'd say, the entire globe. So we try to find knowledge and information sources from around the world and gather it all here and make sure uh, that we have, uh, that our users have access to a wide variety of perspectives, uh, whether it's a student looking for material for their class project or it's a serious researcher who's working on a project that they've been doing for years. So, and we communicate with our users just to be sure what they need. And when we have things that are particularly challenging, we help students to learn how to use them. And we couldn't do this work if we didn't have friends around the world. And so um, that, that's part of my excitement about seeing members of part of the diplomatic corps here visiting us in the library. And I'm very grateful to Elena and to uh, some of my other colleagues who go out into the community and do this work to reach out to people and form relationships. So um, remember us when you have uh, information or things you think might be opportunities for us to make connections so that we uh, we have the best sources of information and material and um, uh, yeah that's all I'm going to say but if you ever hear that we're putting up a program here I hope that you will make the effort just like today to attend Thank you very much, all of you, for coming. And please don't forget to help yourselves to more refreshments. Take care and drive safely. Thank you. Uh, you know, that's, 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 uh, really yeah. Yeah. And this is the donation of the checkbooks in the National Library. Because we looked what the library doesn't have. And, uh, no, these books are uh, books by Czech writers published uh, in English, which are not a part of the UCLA library. But I have added also a few books which are published by Czech writers in uh, uh, African languages and Filipino, which is quite interesting because you have a, a very important Filipino community and they might be interested in reading it. Oh my goodness.
Okay, so um, these books are not duplicates. We worked on it with Alice. Oh. So <laughs> we don't have them. Sure. Oh, this is anthology. I like to read those. We never, never heard about her, never had an idea that she was Czech. <laughs> right. Well. That is, I would, I'm really interested in that. Please contact me, let's sit down and I will, I will ask you many more questions, but first I do my homework and look what I know about the market. And did she spoke Czech? I don't think February. No, 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 no. No, no, no. They just end the event, so they just get the holiday year, a school holiday year. February, March, 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 Thank you.